This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you for joining us for this conversation with, uh, with Alice Fulton. I'm Roger Gilbert. And this is a part of a new series of talks sponsored by the Creative Writing Program um, called In a Word. I think we're having them once a semester. Um, uh, last semester we had a talk by Bob Morgan, right? And next semester it's going to be Ernesto Quinones. Great, excellent. So I want to thank Elena Viramontes, the director of the Creative Writing Program, as well as Sarah Rice and Lynn Lauper, our indefatigable events coordinators, for all the work that they did in, in setting this up. Um, since this is a somewhat informal uh, event, I'm not going to give an elaborate um, introduction. I will just remind everyone that, uh, that Alice Fulton is the Anna S. Bowers uh, professor of English here at Cornell, that she has received many prestigious honors, including a MacArthur Fellowship and the Bobbitt uh, National Prize for Poetry, uh, and that she's the author of seven books of poetry, eight depending on how you count, um, a collection of essays, and a, an absolutely wonderful collection of short stories called The Nightingales of Troy. If you haven't read that, by all means, go out and, and get a copy. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely um, dazzling. But today we'll be talking um, about Alice's most recent book of poems, Barely Composed, uh, copies of which are available outside the auditorium. Uh, I should say that uh, there will be a reception after the uh, uh, talk uh, uh, to which you're all invited, and I believe we're even going to have a new caterer. So, you know, we'll be interested in your feedback. Uh, you can go on Yelp and tell us what you think. Um, and uh, of course, I should also say, turn off your cell phones as if you didn't know enough to do that by now. So um, uh, I think that's it in, in, in the way of preliminaries. And it seemed to me that it would make sense to start by um, inviting you to read the opening uh, poem of the book, uh, wonderfully entitled, Because I Never Practiced with the Escape Chamber. Um, how many of you actually have the books with you, just out of curiosity? Okay, some of you do and, and some, some don't. So we will not presume that you're reading along with us. And it, you don't have to do that. No, no, no. It doesn't no, no. matter. I can't see you, incidentally, because I have my reading glasses on. So it's all kind of a wonderful blur, but I'm imagining you all smiling. <laughs> Friendly faces. Um, okay, well, thank you, Roger. And so we're going to begin with uh, the first poem in my book, Barely Composed. And I should say, too, I think there's some students here, including some of my own faithful students, and I'm grateful to you for being here today. And it's not just about my book. If it, anything about poetry, about poetics that you, you comes to mind, that we'll have some time at the end for uh, conversation, questions, a little time at the end. So um, anything about poetry at all, it, it doesn't have to just focus on, on my book. Um, so I know you have a lot of poetry questions, students. OK, um, so I began the book with a kind of preface, a poem that was a preface. And it's a sonnet. And um, it actually reinscribes a very famous, couple of very famous lines from a sonnet by Shakespeare. Um, the book has quite a bit of quotation from other writers, reinscription, and playing with other writers' words. And uh, mostly in this book, they were just writers I, I know by heart. I didn't have to go look them up very much, except for to make sure I was getting it right. Um, so th that was how it happened. And the lines from Shakespeare are about time. And time is one of the book's um, major subjects. I have said it was about time, death, and love. And when I describe it that way, it seems very dull to me. There's been so much written about those subjects that it scared me to think I had done it, contributed more to it. But uh, that's what it turned out to be about. So uh, the beginning is, I think, a poem about time. And the lines from Shakespeare that I toyed with and reinscribed, rewrote, really, um, are not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme. Because we never practiced with the escape chamber, we had to read the instructions as we sank. 
in a hand like carded lace. Not nuclear warheads on the sea's floor, nor the violet glow over the reactor will outlive this sorrowful rhyme. Vain halo. My project becalmed, I'll find I've built a monument more passing than a breeze. It will cost us, Borisita. We can't buy a prayer. Did you call my name, or was that the floorboard wheezing? These memories won't get any bigger, will they? I think something is coming that will vastly improve our quietude. I'm growing snow crystals from vapor in anticipation and praying for the velvet cushioned kneeler that I need to pray. I made this little sound for you to wait in. <clears throat> so it's short. Yeah. And it, 14 and it, lines. Right. It is a sonnet, and yep. there are several other sonnets in the book. And uh, I feel that here, as in some of the others, you're really engaging in a dialogue with the sonnet tradition, most obviously with Shakespeare. But I thought I also caught a kind of passing um, reference to the famous Wordsworth sonnet, nuns fret not at their convent's narrow rooms, uh, that sense of the sonnet as a chamber. Um, a chamber in which one, or a cell in which one might indulge in prayer. Though here the prayer is, is so wonderfully kind of uh, elusive. You, you're praying for the equipment that will make prayer possible. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the, the language of uh, nuclear warheads and so on, so that, that sort of dystopian language which recurs throughout the book. You know, you're putting together a lot of elements that will r return in various forms. So, I mean, maybe you could just say a, a word or two about why you chose to place this book, this poem at the threshold of, mm. of the book. Yeah, um, I, I've never talked about that, but the last line, I made this little sound for you to wait in. Um, well, the sonnet comes from song, and it's a little song. And so when I said I made this little sound for you to wait in, I was thinking I've made these little poems, and they're a kind of way to pass the time as we wait, <laughs> as we go through it, as we get through it. So I thought it would be a good way to begin the book to say I made these little things that you can, you can read, you can wait, you can meditate on. Um, that, was, that was partly why I thought of it. Um, and the escape chamber, we never practiced, because we never practiced with the escape chamber, you know, I think it's a lot of deferral and not thinking about end things and not thinking about the big questions. We never practiced with how to escape. Uh, so uh, we had to read the instructions as we sank. It just feels to me very much like time, uh, a poem about how time eludes us and we're always in, uh, trying to do these little things that we have to do to make a living and so on, but we don't really think of the big questions. So I put it at the beginning because it seemed to introduce a little bit of love um, when, I, when I say, it will cost us pobrecita, or pobrecito, um, it's uh, a moment of love, and then it had time, and, uh, and death is all over it too, so. <laughs> it's one of these cheery poems that you put at the front of your book to get everybody yeah. in a good mood and ready to read the rest of it. <laughs> since, since you brought up death, um, <clears throat> uh, but well, before we get to that, let me just, um, see if you'd like to say something about the, just the formal range of the book, because it does include several sonnets, including a, a triptych of sonnets. It also includes a villanelle, but then there are poems that are in very radically sort of open uh, forms of various kinds. Um, and I, I think this is something that has become a bit of a signature for you, the refusal to choose between traditional forms and experimental forms. But do, they, do you feel that they play different roles or fill different spaces in, in this book? Well, yeah, for me, when I'm writing them, they do. Um, I've always loved sonnets because they're, they're so short. As a reader, when I, when I read a book, I love to come on a sonnet because it's so wonderfully compact. So I've not written a lot of them, and I thought, okay, um, the time, I, I, time to write a couple more sonnets. So I began um, writing these because I like them, basically, as a, as a form. Uh, the Villanelle came out of a different thing. I was, um, it's a, 
I've never written a villanelle before. It's the first and only one I think I'll ever write. It proved to be very hard. And I never give them as assignments to people because I'm not that mean. It's, uh, <laughs> it's so hard to do it. And I discovered it by trying. But I was, I was taking care of my mother. I was her caregiver when, when she was dying. And she was living with us. And when she was living, too, for a while, she was living with us. But the villanelle is about the experience of of really caring for her as she was dying. And so I, uh, the same lines kept going through my head. And I thought, I should write a poem that has a recurring, a recurring line uh, so I can use this again and again and get that obsessive quality of grief where you're, you, you just see the mind goes into a groove and you keep thinking the same thing over and over again. So um, that's how the villanelle came to be. And I don't think I... <laughs> I can't remember what it's called or anything, but... Um, oh, it's... Uh, <laughs> I know what it's called. I, here it is, I think. Oh, my gosh, the spirits are with me. The book opened to it. It really did, and I haven't, I haven't marked it. So it's called Still World Nocturne. Should I read it? Yes, actually, okay. please. We hadn't planned on this. this I need wasn't Roger's on our, permission. Completely. This wasn't on the set list, but... No we, have no, we have no plan. I mean, this is for people who like spontaneity, I hope. Um, so it's called Still World Nocturne because so much took place at night when, when you're caring for someone who's very ill. You know, a lot happens at night. And um, one of the recurring lines, Villanelle has a couple of things, lines that keep twisting back again. But one of them is, uh, only night is watching the night nurse. Listen, only night is watching the night nurse. And her smoker's voice is not a voice I trust. Yet I wake up, and the world's still here, a blur of how to speak or dress, which words or skirt or pair of powdered, tear-resistant gloves. Sisters, only night is watching the night nurse. And no matter what we've heard, she's heard much worse. The vacuums roar, our mother crying, mother, and asking if the world's still here. While versed in flawed priorities, I numbly parse a sweat of student essays, changing is to was. Children, only night is watching the night nurse. Tomorrow, we'll confess all our concerns about that villanelle's dumb rhymes on love. We'll wake up to the world that's here, a burr of sun stuck to a catheter's gold purse. Queasy music, wicked drugs. Still, mother, only night will watch as I, the night nurse, wake up to a world on here, on yours. <laughs> There's not much to say about that other than it, it, it is really uh, gorgeous and um, a really, uh, I think, virtuosic uh, use of the form because you're not, it's, there are some villanelles just strictly repeat those two alternating lines, but you're not doing that. You're working variations on them. In fact, the second line ends differently each time, so that really requires a lot of um, resourcefulness to, to make it work. And, the, the balancing of repetition and, and change seems somehow to uncannily capture what it must have felt like to be living through this sort of ongoingness and yet the sense of, of encroaching, um, you know, death. Well, you know, I was actually trying to make it perfect, and so <laughs> I didn't know it went so far away from the form, but I'm sure you're right, because I was just trying to... <laughs> I was trying to just get it to be what it's supposed to be and get all those rhymes in place that you're supposed I don't rhyme very much. As a poet, I don't write very much that's rhyming. So for me to rhyme a poem was kind of difficult, and I was just trying to do it right. But a number of people have said it's kind of off. So <laughs> I, Off is not the word I, I would think, choose. I think that's... Artful, no, you were very artfully, complimentary. elegantly varied, whatever. But... You know, this is a poem. Now, th so this poem comes late in the book, relatively late in the book, page 56. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it is one of the most uh, sort of direct renderings of the what may what could be said to be the central trauma, the the, the illness and death of your mother. There are 
uh, references to it in other poems, and particularly to that really sort of uh, um, horrifying moment of your mother calling for her own mother. Um, but you know, you don't come at this in the kind of direct narrative way that many poets would. I mean, we're living in a time when a lot of poets are publishing entire books of elegies, and this book too is very strongly elegiac. It's full of uh, some of the poems incorporate the term elegy, um, and I think even looking at the dedication, one can infer that this is a book that is written in large part out of uh, the process of, of uh, remembering and mourning for your, for your mother, but you, 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 uh, you come at it obliquely, and that interests me very much, um, that impulse to not, um, to, to some extent, to encode or encrypt uh, these generative experiences, these central experiences of loss. Um, there are others in addition to the, to the, to the loss of your mother. Um, and all of this led me to think about your use of the Philomela story in the poem, which is too long, I, I think, probably for you to read today, but uh, Forcible Touching, which is an amazing poem. Absolutely, you, you should look at it. It's woven together of many different elements, including, of all things, a child's coloring book, uh, sort of testimony to um, the uh, cruelty to animals uh, that are being um, exterminated, uh, and references to the great uh, Greek story of, I'm never sure how to pronounce it, Philomela or Philomela, uh, which the poet critic Alan Grossman has called one of the founding stories of, of uh, poetic production. Um, and the key moment in that story is that Philomela, who's been raped, has had her tongue cut out by her rapist, and therefore she cannot tell of what's happened to her, and instead she weaves it in a tapestry, and you sum up that, that story so beautifully in the lines, when there's a story you cannot speak, you weave. Uh, it's just a, a very um, striking condensation of the myth, and I'm wondering whether you feel that does, to some extent, describe uh, the aesthetic approach of this book, a kind of weaving rather than or in addition to direct speech? Uh, and if so, what are, the, what are the threads? What are the warp and weft that you're weaving here? I, I think poetry is like that anyway, that you can't be very direct when you write poetry because it wouldn't be poetry. There wouldn't be anything for the reader to do or not enough for the reader to figure out and think about. So. Yeah, I, I did think of it as weaving, and um, I was attracted to that story, and I've always said the name differently, Philom Philomela? Philomela, okay. I, I said Philomela, but anyway, you know who I mean. It's, it's the person whose tongue was cut out, and um, there's a section of the book that's about censorship, actually, and in that section um, is the poem that, Robin, that Roger was describing, Forcible Touching and it has the figure of the woman whose tongue was cut out. It has the animals who can't speak. Uh, I think animals are so moving because they don't have, they don't have a language, a verbal language. Uh, they're in it. And then there's this awful coloring book um, that was, I, I saw at a funeral parlor. I had to go to this terrible funeral and I, it was given to children. And it was a, uh, for children to color the funeral scenes to color the casket and to color the, the little chipmunk who went to the funeral. And, you know, it was so ghastly. And it was meant to be a kind of grief counseling device. So from that, I began looking into grief counseling and what kids were told. And some of the things that that, that coloring book haunted me. And I actually wrote to the funeral home and asked them to send me a copy. And they did. And so I was able to kind of quote from it uh, in, this, in this poem, Forcible Touching, thinking of the coloring as being a kind of a force, forcible, obsessive coloring of the page and going over and over the scene. So um, I think actually maybe, um, well, your question was, the, does the whole book weave? And it, I think it does. It, it's got other notes in it. This, I'm hitting all the grim notes right now, but it's, it has other satirical, um, edgier, sharper notes, anger. There's anger in it. There's just, I think, some funny things in it. Um, I hope there's some self-mockery in it. So it, it's a kind of weaving together, going through different states uh, that I was in when I was 
writing this, I guess, what I was thinking about. I wonder if it would be good to um, read uh, just the ending of Forcible Touching, and then um, it would be a, a good way to go into the poem we're going to project about censorship. Okay. Yes. Because this is about not being able to speak uh, quite long, but I'm just going to read the end of it. And then we have a poem that we'll project, and it's one where I took the some things from the coloring book, uh, some lines, and redacted them as if it were a censored document. Um, and you'll see it will be it will be projected after I read the end of the end of this poem if I can find it here. Oh, I don't know. Um, oh, I know where it is. Okay. Um, One of the types of censorship I was thinking about was political uh, torture and waterboarding and how people in various terrible predicaments have been censored and how speech itself can be, to, to force speech is a kind of uh, censoring as well. If you think of false testimony and people who are forced, uh, forced to bear false witness uh, with things like waterboarding. And there is one poem that thinks about that as a form of, of censoring language. But I'll just read the end of this forcible touching, which is more personal, and uh, has references to this terrible loss of a young person, a child, and a funeral, and the coloring book that was given to console children about death. If a child draws word bubbles from the casket to the Chipmunk Town Cemetery sign, it is fibrillating. It is twilight spring, flesh rose, dust bite. Remove hard nubs like flesh bones from the ears, and the bad animal sounds fly back. They become birds, hoopo, swallow, nightingale. Coloring the grave may initiate a feeling. If the child presses, at the cemetery, some special words are said, and the casket with the body in it is buried in a grave, so hard the crayon breaks, or colors the page all silvery shades, it is milkshaking. Use clicker training. It is granite gray, and outer space gargoyle, gas, smoke, dirt. Children may resent you later for not being. They may even feel. There's a hole in your ghost. You will die and anyone sick will. Even the hospital will die. Come on, so. The voice of the shuttle is overness. So many times I've cut out my own tongue. Never tell the child Vivid, violet, purple, heart, torch, red, atomic, tangerine. When there's a story you cannot speak, you weave. It is too bright to rest your eyes on. But if you contort yourself, your shadow will fall over it. It is a good idea. It is quite surprising. and that is a sort of magnificent weave of things. I, I wanted to pick up on you know, your reference to the political aspects of the book as well and, and the forms of silencing and violence uh, and trauma that you see in, in that realm and that come from things like uh, Abu Ghraib and other, other s settings where uh, torture and, uh, and political oppression are uh, exerted. And, the thing that I, I guess fascinates me endlessly is the relationship between the kind of feeling evoked by those forms of suffering and the kind of feeling evoked by the more personal and immediate uh, suffering that is also um, a source in this, in this book, the grief over very personal loss and the grief and indeed rage at suffering and trauma on a, on a very different scale that has identifiable causes. I, I guess for me, the, the, the question comes down to how do we negotiate between 
the universality of death and the specificity of particular kinds of oppression and violence. And um, it seems to me this book kind of explores the space between those, uh, those forms of suffering and trauma and, and the, the feelings they evoke. So if you could say something about how you found yourself uh, you know, inhabiting that space in, in the book. Oh, it's a very hard question. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think sometimes the the poems I wrote that uh, have have references to torture um, actually came out of thinking about animals initially, and then I began to think of humans and the human body and uh, physicality and how we suffer physically and the worst forms of suffering. And I got to that by thinking about the animals. And there's one poem in the book called A Tongue Tie of Vet Rap. And it does have that, um, it does refer to Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and, um, but I got to it thinking about racehorses and how their tongues are tied down when they race. And I was watching, um, I don't know, Kentucky Derby or something, and you can see these little bows under their chins, and you can see their tongue is actually tied down. So of course it was, it was playing into this notion of the tongue and language and how we can't speak. And then I began thinking of people who are, who are tortured and have to bear false witness, forced to say things that are not true and how it goes both ways. Um, so suffering is suffering, I guess. And when I was in my own, my own kind of suffering, I, I began looking at other people's and thinking how worse it had been for other people. You know, it, it's always a matter of scale and, there can be a kind of comforting in reading a poem that's about despair because you don't you feel accompanied. And one of the things I tried to do was read narratives of people who had suffered incredibly and survived. And tried to think, how did they survive? How did they get through that? You know, how did they go on? How did they get up the next day? So it was one of the powers of testimony, of other people's testimony. Uh, how they got through their lives after these incredibly terrible experiences that gave scale to mine. It put mine on a kind of, you know, more level, universal scale because we all lose people, while some people have suffered in ways that the magnitude is are such that we don't usually endure. Uh, so I think the two were connected in my mind that way. I was looking for help. I was really looking for narratives that would um, show me how to get through it. <laughs> and how other people got through worse things. And, and that's how I came to write about torture. And of course, reading it was torture. <laughs> reading about it is terrible. And reading what people go through was quite painful, but um, we have to, you know, I think it's part of what you have to face up to, uh, what other people have been through. So, and then I tried to make it a poem that would be bearable for readers and to put things in it that would be moments of respite and, um, a place to rest in the poem so it wouldn't be unremitting and um, it could be something people could stand to read that they would want to read. Language to me is, a, is a, a cushion. My poems tend to have a lot of surface. Uh, they have a lot of, uh, by surface I mean linguistic, uh, thickness to the surface of the language. And to me that's a kind of mediating, a mediating cushion between some of the darkest things and, what, and when we're taking it in, the language is what comforts us. The language itself allows us to, to be with it and to look at it. And so language, uh, the language I tried to create was the mediator that allowed, I hope, people to read about these experiences. If they had been told baldly, I, I read some of the bald testimony and it's just so hard. So with language you can not make it pretty, I don't mean that, but you can sort of add a lingui linguistic layering of complication. And then the brain has something else to do when it's reading the text, other than just um, reading straight documents of suffering. The brain is actually thinking about some of the linguistic aspects of the poem. So that's, that's what poetry gives us, I think, when we write about these things. Some of that tension is really captured in the title of the book, barely composed, the composing, the constructing, the artifice is, is an absolutely crucial element, but so is the, the, the bearing, uh, the, bear, the barely in the sense of making things more bare, more um, 
uh, not necessarily bald in the, in the way you were using the term, but allowing us to see through the, the layers of artifice that you have kind of um, established. Maybe this would be, I mean, I, I could catalog the many different kinds of artifice that you, that you employ uh, from um, riddles and jokes and puzzles and allusions, idioms, all kinds of layerings of metaphor and wordplay. There is a lot of humor in this book. I mean, this is, <laughs> ha, despite its, you know, uh, at times heartbreaking um, uh, elements, you know, I just pull, pulled out some, some of my favorite uh, one-liners, which I thought I could, uh, a few of which I thought I could share. For example, um, there's no dress code, though leg irons are always appropriate. Um, <laughs> We have a saying, nothing is allowed, but that which is allowed is compulsory. <laughs> I could hear Stephen Wright saying that. Um, do you really think those shades you wear above your head will keep the sun out of your mind? Uh, the suicide prevention fest was canceled because of rain. And there's so many more. So I just want to second the- Thank you for bringing uh, that up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad there are lighter moments. And two, it's not, it's not a whole text that's got all this thick language because I really like to write some very plain lines and throw in a real direct statement and it's foregrounded because you're surrounding it with other types of diction and whatnot. So sometimes just to throw in something really direct I think is the best way to, to break up the surface of, well, of the Well, those last poem. lines of a forcible touching, it is a good idea, it is quite surprising. That's... Yeah, very flat. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, maybe this would be a, a, a moment to look at a, a poem of a kind of uh, extreme playful artifice, Reckoning Frame, which you mentioned before, and which is a poem that you really have to see, and therefore we have it uh, ready to be projected. So this is a poem where I redacted parts of that coloring book that I mentioned. Um, and it's about censorship, obviously, I guess. But I think when, when language is censored, it warps. And something strange happens to language under pressure. When you can't say what you really mean, you begin saying other things that turn out very strange and kind of warped. So that's what I was going for. Um, I think of it as when there's no language equal to experience, this strange hidden language emerges. Uh, the language or the experience of traumatic witness, for example, would, s would warp speech into, into strangeness. So this is my attempt to create a thwarted, mutilated tongue, a language forged by secrecy and, uh, and marked by duress. So I will give it a try, and try to read this thing. A document of disassociation and horror. Reckoning frame. Tell the truth, rage but never force. Go and in and, O oh, is the widest word. Pull it tight and anchor it with a knot. A forming andaged, twisted to a sting. Not even vet wrap laced in the dark. A corset ice, ouch-safed with stays or a simple ice of hosiery, fastened so the tongue is exed as far as possible. Do not speak when spoken to in a vice. At a time like this, it's pain why. It is good to have ouching. Let them ache some. This aches them closer. This aches them feel. This is not rue. This is normal and should. It is oh, it is all. Tell the truth, time does us. It has me, it has laced me in ever force. The grave ate feeling. It is X ink. Do not wear bright anything. Keep your never person laced in the dark. This is natural, is, is normal and even, is, is rue. It aced me in the dark, 
its tongue against the oof, ooshing the alive aback. Reader reactor, if voice inks to a isper, say, say it. Now is, is mall eve. Even the will die. That's, uh, that, I'd say that goes Gertrude Stein one better. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I looked up the title because I was certain, and, and I think that phrase, reckoning frame, occurs in, in one or two other places in the book. I, I seem to remember seeing it in another poem. Good. And I thought, I was sure, oh, that must be some, because you like to take technical terms from uh, strange you know, realms and, and use them in your poems. But all that came up when I Googled it was Alice Fulton. So I assume that <laughs> that's good. It's just something that you made up. Well, or I is always there a, thought, such a thing as a reckoning frame? I thought it was an expression. I don't know. I thought that that was something everybody said once in a while. Well, there's the reckoning frame. I, I Has thought anyone it was an here idiom. Ever, ever heard themselves say I that? I actually thought I, it was an idiom that we use, but uh, if I made it up, all the better. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Well, let's see. We're, I guess, at the point where we could start to uh, take questions from the audience. Um, I mean, you and I could go on talking all night. Gosh, but, uh, yeah. There are a lot of people here who may have questions. Yes. Hello. I can't see you, but. Oh, Layla. Thank you for being here. Nice. Nice. Um, I have a question more about the latest. Okay. Good. Uh, so you talked about how you wrote the I toyed with these things myself and find them really difficult, um, like you said. So I, I guess I'm wondering more, like in general, why do we continue practicing these structures? Like, why are these forms things that are somewhat recycled from generation to generation? Um, I really love the sonnet that you read at the beginning, uh, but if like, I sit down and try to write one, um, I might find the structure a little bit impressive, even. So you just comment on why you choose to use those forms. Yeah. Um, I think I, I don't really think of it very formally when I, when I write them. So if you just thought that you wanted to write a 14-line poem, that would be a very basic way to begin. And uh, I'm sure you could, you could do that, write the 14-line poem. And then you'd look at it and think, well, it looks kind of like a sonnet. So I guess when I revise it, maybe I could think more about um, how it could go that way. And, the sonnet does some things that are really attractive. Uh, there's a turn at, I guess it's line eight, where there's a shifting of the ground. And it gives you a kind of um, instruction. And you can push against it, or you can work with it. And it's, um, it's a constraint. And you know from writing poetry at all that there's constraint can be, can be why you want to write it, because you've got the constraint of the line, um, you've got well, all writers have constrained to the page and so on. I'm frequently telling students, that poem's not going to fit on the page because the, the line can get so long and then you, you know, you've got to think it's not going to work. So the sonic gives us all of that baggage that we can argue with, that we can think about, that we can, in my case, remember fondly because I read so many sonnets when I, all my life. Um, and I have all this sonnet baggage that's kind of in my head that I can... I can think, oh, I was so moved by that sonnet by Keats or Shakespeare. And, um, you know, I, I kind of think of that as a bar that's set, that if I could write a sonnet like that. And for the villanelle, it's the repetition, I think, that you get to recycle and have that obsessive turning. But, Layla, your latest poem is really minimally, it's minimal and skinny and wonderful. I mean, you crafted it so well. And if someone had asked you, well, how can you write something so so minimal and crafted, where the lines are so short, uh, that's very hard to do, too. And you put yourself under a kind of a formal constraint when you wrote it in that particular way. And I think it's an elegy, too, which has all that baggage of the genre. So I think, as a poet, we, we just begin thinking of what poets have done in the past and what poets are doing now. And sometimes it's fun to go backwards. You know, it's fun to go and write in the old form. Any, like a huzzle, or it doesn't have to be a Western literary tradition. It could be, uh, I have a poem in here, the Doha, 
um, it's called Doha Meltdown or something like that. Doha Meltdown Elegy, yes. Thank you. It's got the elegy in it, too. <laughs> Doha Meltdown Elegy. And the Doha is a form from India. And it's a, it's a kind of religious uh, question and answer form. So I was looking for something to make a poem less didactic, actually. You know, if you kind of have something that you want to say, but you want to be oblique, I thought, well, question and answer is, is interesting because you can raise the question and the answer doesn't have to answer it directly. And so I looked at some Doha things and very d indirectly used, used that tradition very, very loosely to write a long, a long sequence. You know, Alice, since you mentioned that poem, I, I did want to ask you about the last line or, or simply highlight it as an example of how you f managed to uh, work together um, wordplay and other kinds of playfulness with really um, incredibly uh, moving um, um, expression. Uh, the, the last line of that poem, which is one of the, the, probably the longest poem in the book, is I will sieve the ether for her. She is so nearly here. I will sieve the ether for her. She is so nearly here. And this is, of course, another elegy for your mother. Um, and, you know, that line in itself, incredibly beautiful and lyrical and heartbreaking. And yet it's also, I think, very word conscious. I will sieve the ether. Ether contains her. For her, she is so nearly here. And of course, her is nearly here. All you do is add an E. And so it, it amazes me that you can work on both of those levels, that you can craft a line that is simultaneously moving and eloquent and playful and witty. Can you just tell us how you do that? <laughs> oh, gee. Um, I think it's, I, I always think writing comes from character and that you write what you are. And my students, I, I I always give these sort of commissioned poems, I call them, where I ask you to write me a poem for on commission uh, and do it this way, or write me this subject. But I, I've realized these, every poet begins with what they're going to end up with in a certain way, because writing is coming from everything that you are. So when I'm teaching, I'm realizing each student is already there. You know, the poet they are is, is already there. And for me, with this humor and and sadness, I don't think we can stand sadness without humor. And um, I, can't, I can't stop myself from making a little joke or you know, turning, turning a phrase and laughing a little bit sometimes. And that's just coming directly from how I think. And it wasn't anything I tried for. I, I can't resist it. And I think, too, I don't like, um, I really don't like sappy poems that are too sentimental. I don't like levels of diction that are very sentimental. And so by putting in something that um, steps back, steps back enough to see the lighter side, um, I, try to I think I avoid or try to avoid the sentimental aspect of, of grief. And then, too, it's in my family. I think I grew up in a family where the funerals had jokes. And my sisters would tell these amazing jokes and stories. And they were better at it than I was. Uh, about being funny, about you know the corpses and everything. Everything was up for grabs. And um, when people were bringing the food to the house once after my father died, he died when I was 20. Um, people were bringing over you know casseroles and stuff that nice neighbors do. And my sister said, "Well, we'll put a sign out in front that says Alice is a vegetarian." <laughs> and, you know, they always had the cynical, that cynical note. So I kind of always grew up with um, not only the funeral, but the joke that, that someone would make. And the, the line that Roger quoted, I never thought of as, as being lightweight or <laughs> light at all. Not lightweight. But I never thought of a joke in it. I just thought that it was kind of flat. I, I worried about the ending of this poem. It's a long sequence, and I didn't know how to end it. I didn't know how to get out of it. And then I wrote this quiet line. I think it's, to me, very quiet. And I thought, well, that's really a letdown. That's not good. And even when I, it's the last book, I, uh, the last poem I wrote for the book, the last one I actually finished. And I wasn't at all sure I'd hit the right tone for this. And um, I, I said that to you, Roger, when, when you read this book. I said, I don't think that last line is 
working. And Roger was nice enough to say, oh yes, it's, you know, and I'll read it again. It's the her and the here. I will sieve the ether for her. She is so nearly here. I just thought that doesn't do much, but I guess, I guess I've liked it better as time goes on. It, it appeals to the uh, punster and me. Okay, the her and her, yeah. The but, conflation of those two. Well, in the yeah. sense that the words somehow are themselves telling the story of, of grieving and the reaching for a presence that is both there and not there. Exactly. Yeah. Other questions? It's also very beautiful because it's so airy. I mean, the whole line is breath from the bridge. Does it stop at all? Thank you, thank you. And the sieving of the ether is, when you sieve the ether, you know, it goes right through the sieve and you don't wind up with anything left. It's not like sieving flour or anything with materiality. If you sieve the ether, you, you have nothing you can hold on to. So you're, you're right, it has a lot of air in it, I think, that particular image. Yeah, you, you spoke of your limited uh, use of rhyme. Um, could you say something about your own responsiveness to rhyme in other writing, other writers? I, I enjoy it if it's done well. You know, I, I like it. Uh, again, all those old poems that, that rhymed um, are beautiful. But there are some rhymes that are just so overused and night and light and, you know, perfect rhymes. And so rhyme is very, very hard. I think, at this point, to use. And I, I tend to like the slant rhymes and the off rhymes better than the perfect, the perfect rhymes. Uh, but it certainly is pleasing because there's something so musical about it, and it knits the poem together. A rhyme really knits the text, and if you can hear it, you hear the music, it draws those two things together that might be unrelated, uh, and it puts them in conversation conjunction with each other. So I think, I think it has that effect. And I like it very much. But my rhymes are usually internal, in the middle of the line. They're not end rhyme. I guess that's what I mean, that I don't do the end rhymes. But um, I like rhyme in the middle and at the front of the line and hidden, sort of secret, secret rhymes in the poem. Uh, this is an MFA question. Oh. Um, there are times when we tell um, our students something that they're very unhappy about, only for it to ring true years later. You study with the great Archie Ammons. Do you have a similar experience or story you want to share where he told you something that you were not happy with, only for it to ring true to you years later? Oh, I, I think he probably did. Uh, in fact, I touched on one thing already that was I thought of Archie when I said it. Um, when I met him, I, I came here is to get my MFA at Cornell. And uh, the first time I met Archie was down in the old uh, cafeteria with the statues and Goldwyn Smith. And he, I'd sent him a little chapbook I'd published. And he said, well, you can come here if you want to. Um, and you can hang out with us. You can hang around. But I have nothing to teach you. Your poems are there already. And at the time, I totally did not believe him. And I took it, the first meaning that you would hear would be, oh, your work is fine, it's all finished, that chapbook you sent me is perfect. And I knew that wasn't true. I knew I had a lot to learn. I could be better, I can write more. So what did he mean when he said, you can come here, but I have nothing to teach you. Your poems are there already. And since then, I've thought of the scroll, and Archie had a poem on a long um, scroll, a recording, you know, what is the adding, adding, adding machine. machine tape. Uh, and I've thought that what he meant was that poems are inside you on this scroll, and that with time, your poems are in you already. And over time, you will just pull them out of yourself, and they will unscroll. But I didn't understand what he meant by that until about maybe six years ago. I never thought of the double meaning of your poems are there, already. It doesn't mean they're finished or perfect. It means that whatever you can write, you'll write. And, you know, a teacher, a teacher can only do so much. 
Doesn't Emily Dickinson have a poem with that image, you know, split the lark and you see oh, all these yeah. scrolls of God, music? God, I love that. That's right. Split the lark and you'll find the music. Yeah. And I, I wrote a poem called Split the Lark because I love that so much. Yes, and that's Naima, right? Uh, nice, I recognize your voice. Um, yeah, I think, well, all poetry has its formal strictures, but sometimes I think the writer needs a received form from the tradition, from a tradition, and it doesn't matter what tradition, but a received form of, it's comforting. You don't have to make it up, make up your own form, you don't have to make it up from scratch. And there isn't that instability that is uh, there to a higher degree, I think, when you write free verse. And one of the great things about free verse is its instability at times, that you can throw people a curve and the meter is jagged. And, um, but sometimes the writer needs to know that there's this other form I can return to and it will tell me what I have to do. And I will make a language that fits that form. And I'll make it new if I can. And I think that's really exciting, and it's something that people need psychologically, I think, at, at various times to hold on to. But there are other times when you want to blow it wide open, be spontaneous, and be wild. And um, one of the things I'm interested in that isn't meter or rhyme is just rhetoric. I'm, I'm very, very interested in the rhetoric of how people talk and speech and um, phrasing. And so when I'm writing a poem that isn't uh, formal, I'm very often thinking of levels of rhetoric and how things can be said and how language has changed over hundreds of years and trying to resuscitate maybe old ways of speaking and what will they do to, to the associative effect, what will they do to the emotive effect of the poem, how will emotion be felt if I use that uh, rhetoric from the way Jane Austen might have written, for example. There's a poem in the book that lifts a whole a whole rhetoric from sense and sensibility, um, and I, re, I kind of rework it, but what does it do? What, emo what emotion do we feel when people have that formal aspect seeping into uh, the language of the poem? That's something I've, I've thought about a lot. And then the jokes and what we do with rhetoric now, uh, the way we speak now. Yeah, there's a line that I particularly like where you mash up a couple of different idioms. When it says I made a right dog's dinner of things, it's on vacation brain. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that poem, there's one line in there that I oh, is kind of funny. It's the one I, I'd have to, what's the name of that poem, Roger? Uh, that I haven't is, read this uh, book in a, a long time. A thinkable rampage. A thinkable rampage, yes. Um, I don't know if I can find it, but it's the one that has Jesus in it, actually. <laughs> I made a Jesus joke in, in this poem. I don't know if I can find it, though. Oh, here it is, The Thinkable Rampage. Um, yeah, OK, it's right by the line Roger just quoted. When it says I made a right dog's dinner of things, it's on vacation brain. Don't sweat it. Though as Jesus once told me, sweat is the smell of sanctity. You know, it's these conversations I have with Jesus every night. I just took, you know, it's like as Hank once told me or as Roger once told me. I thought, well, as Jesus once told me, sweat is the smell of sanctity. Uh, so after I said, don't sweat it, I thought, well, maybe we should. Maybe we should. Um, then he unplugged the cooling unit that, that pumped sub-zero through my moves, and my passions grew me into a candle. And so it goes on with getting hot you know, emotionally and brain hot. And that's an unusual poem formally. I think it's the only one in the book that really just sort of spreads itself out all over the page. So uh, you just allow yourself to do whatever, whatever you want at any time, don't you? Um, <laughs> I mean, as a poet. 
That's how I did this book. You're absolutely right. You know, with the other, other books I've written, there have been commissions. There have been poems, as I say to my students, I'm giving you a commission. Well, I, I've written things because people gave me an assignment, and I, or I gave myself an assignment. But um, for this book, I thought, I am not going to have any self-assignments, and I'm not going to take any assignments from anybody. I am going to write what I feel like writing, what I want to write. Uh, so it's true. I, I just let it be whatever, whatever it was going to be. And then at the end, people sometimes wonder, well, you're left, especially when people are putting together a thesis for the MFA, you, you've got all these poems. How do you form them into something? And that was really uh, where you can see that your mind was, was working all along on these similar threads. I always think you don't have to have a, in poetry, you don't have to have a little box or a theme or a subject. Your subconscious, your life is going to show you, it's going to make the book for you. And then at the end, you, you can structure it and maybe toward the end, work toward it a little bit more. Work toward things that you see you were, you were interested in. Maybe in the last third of the book, you would work to make it more like that. I, I think that's how I wrote this. At the end, I wrote more about gifts. That was something to, you know, it's happy, a gift. And to uh, get, think, think of things that were happier than grief would be to think of gifts and ceremonies that were communal and community rather than solitude. So I got, I got there finally. But would you say that you, that that's not the arc of the book as it is organized, is it? I, to some extent it is, or did you sort of intersperse poems that you wrote later with poems that you'd written earlier? Well, I didn't, I didn't structure it at all as I wrote it. Uh, I just wrote the poems, and then very, very much toward the end, I put them in a structure. But the last, the last part, I think, is, um, is about newness. It's about, there's a poem called Make It New, quoting from Ezra Pound's famous, um, famous um, slogan for the, for the uh, images to telling them to make it new for modernism. So there's a poem about that. But then there's a, a poem about New Year's Eve, uh, a, and just all sorts of ways to cast off the old and make it new come in at the end. Yeah. And there's gifts. that poem about uh, the gift giving. Uh, I had a line from that I wanted to quote too uh, as an example of humor. Uh, and when you said I gave you what I wanted myself, I gave you what I didn't want. Gift certificates to spas that wax hearts. A blind date with the inventor of friction. <laughs> I mean, that is, that's amazing. <laughs> Strange, but... <laughs> Well, I wrote that one because I, I was calling a friend to wish him happy birthday, and I wanted to read him a poem, because he, he was somebody who would sometimes call me and actually sing me a song, and he has a beautiful voice. So I thought, what, I, what can I do? And then I realized there are very few poems written for birthdays. There's, it's hard to find a poem that just says happy birthday. So I wanted something, and I thought, I'll have to write it. I'll have to write a happy a birthday. So I wrote this poem called You Own It, and it's about trying to find the perfect gift to give to someone, uh, and it's got all this funny kind of fun stuff. It's, it, is, it is a poem I tried to have fun with, just uh, having a good time. Uh, one, maybe one or two more questions. Uh, uh, I think I saw you first. Do you have a favorite poem from the collection, and so why is it your favorite? Oh, that's hard, I don't know. I, I always, you know, it's like a mother who, who likes the child that has the, Problem, uh, the problem child. <laughs> so I would pick the poem that no one else likes. <laughs> and it would be one that people found hard. Uh, one that I, I liked a lot was, uh, let's see, it's called Personal Reactor. And I almost called the book Personal Reactor. And it's a hard poem because it's got the rhetoric stolen from the early 19th century. Um, it's got the Jane Austen diction, but it's also got kind of humor and some funny things in it. And um, I, I like that poem because it's so strange, but I think it's one of the more difficult poems for people to understand, actually. And I kind of knew that when I wrote it. Yes. As someone who's written both poetry and fiction, can you talk a little bit about how you know whether a subject or an image is going to become a poem or a piece of fiction? Yeah, I can talk about that. Andy, I recognize your voice. 
because um, Andy writes poems and fiction. Um, I think I, I began writing fiction for two reasons, because I love it, as well as I, I love it as much as I love poetry. And writers should always write the books they love to read. The books they love should be the ones they're trying to write. But for me, I, I had put some narrative in poems. I had some more narrative in my earlier books in poetry. And I felt very hampered by trying to make it poetry and tell a story. And I realized in poetry, I probably don't even want to really tell a story. But yet I did have stories and characters and people. So I thought, well, I think I'll just write fiction and I'll write the characters and I'll write the narrative and the stories and that will be fiction. And then I can go wild in the poems. And the poems can be this place where I don't have to have people and I don't have to have characters and I don't have to have narrative tension. There's no story problem. There isn't anything like that in lyric poetry or in many other types of poetry. So poetry became better for me when I had a place to put all those narrative urges and put them in fiction. So for me, when I want to tell a story, that's, that's fiction. And when I want to write about something that's more meditative or about feeling and about language and ideas, and it has no tension, and it has no story problem or characters, well, that would be where I would go to the poem. So it, it wasn't that hard for me to finally make a division between the two. Now, some people combine them, and that's great. You know, People love to do that now. But I'm, I, I love traditional fiction. I love the pleasure of narrative. And I didn't want to write a book of fiction that was, like, um, that was too much like poetry, that was too close to, the, to poetry. I really wanted to write fiction, the kind I like to read. Or see writing any more fiction? If I live long enough. <laughs> fiction is long. Uh, yeah, it's like Conrad had a line about that, right? Um, fiction takes time, especially for me, because I was completely self-taught, except for in fiction, and never took a workshop or had really had a teacher, except for other writers were my teachers in fiction. So I think uh, poetry for me is a little bit faster. I have a lot more experience with it. But I would love to write a novel because I wrote short stories, and you're always, for me, ending it. You know, you see, you're at the beginning, and you have to see the end, or you can at least, if you don't see it, you know it's going to be here pretty soon. While with a novel, I feel like I could be a little bit more leisurely and discursive, and I could, I could wander a little more. So uh, I'm very tempted to do that, but I also want to write more poetry. So it's all about time. It's it's for writers. I think it's always about time. And I guess that means it's about time for us to... Thank you. Thank you so much for being you. here. Uh, please join us upstairs in the English Lounge for the reception. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.